Yeah, hello, welcome. Um, nice to be with you together, even if it's only online, but uh, yeah, we, we all hope that we also can meet physically soon again. Um, I will speak about the fruits of another exhibition project that we realized in uh, 2014 with uh, the same title, Jukebox Jukebox. Um, and uh, I will take you on a journey around the globe uh, through the uh, emerging global music culture and how it was brought into being, not at least by Jewish migrants who mainly made the big journey from the East to the West. And I will start um, my PowerPoint and I think you need to host to make me into a co-host. Um, if I am, I can start to open my screen. Yeah, you are co-host. Okay. Then I just have to select the right way. So I hope you see my screen. And uh, the first image you saw was actually the real jukebox that we had in our um, exhibition uh, filled with all kind of popular music from the 1930s up to till today by Jewish musicians. Um, and it was a show that produced a lot of funny visitors um, and visitors who had fun in the exhibition. This is actually a shot from the London um, presentation of the exhibition at the Jewish Museum. Um, and people really had fun in the show and the fun was partly because they really were confronted with a lot of insights they did not expect. Uh, people stayed there for hours listening to music, but also listening to the personal stories that we collected for the exhibition, because there was one point that triggered our project from the very beginning. And that is that not only music, but in particular records, Vinyl and shellac records for many, many, many decades were kind of uh, capsules of emotions. And they were very much connected not only to an audio experience, but they were also connected with a physical experience. I mean, um, who still uses vinyl records at home knows that there's a certain delicacy about these objects. Um, and Listening to music and listening to records in particular very often had to do with the creating with creating of identity in the decisive years in your teens uh, when you um, are a young uh, girl or boy or a young adult and you start to define yourself. So one part of the exhibition was also asking people about what record changed your life. And people were listening to these stories in the exhibition. Wait, why does it? Okay. But to start with a little technical detail, um, a lot of the coming into being of the record business and with the record business, the global music business, because the record business for the first time allowed music to be recorded and to be sent throughout the world, even before the radio was invented. Um, and the first technical um, equipment that was used for that was um, the Edison um, phonograph. You see an example uh, here in the showcase. And this was a, technic that, a technical advice that was invented by Thomas Albert Edison in 1877. And it had one big disadvantage at that time you could make one recording and then you had one um, of these uh, 
uh, round this, uh, uh, I just forgot this word, how it was called, the Walze. Um, you had one thing and you could, re you could play it, but you were not able with this technical equipment to make mass reproductions of the music. So it was a very delicate business at that time to make recordings. Um, if they wanted to record music, a singer had to stay for a week in the studio and sing the same song ever and ever and ever again to allow the company to sell more than one recording. But then a certain Mr. Emil Berliner, 10 years later, um, at, uh, came on the stage and created this very simple device with the record. At that time, the Shellac record. Um, that was um, something that you could uh, reproduce in masses. And actually with this gramophone, as he called it, the whole story of global music began. And he was also uh, very much interested in really advertising his stuff. So he was also able to create the first logo, the first brand um, with the dog who was listening to his master's voice, something that became famous for many, many years. And uh, you still see it um, at record shops that even don't sell vinyl records anymore, but CDs or MP3s or whatever. Um, it was not because he was a Jew, but it was because of, at that time, there was a certain type of star rising as well, not only the popular musicians, but also the cantors at that time. The cantors singing in the synagogue became stars. They attracted mass audiences and they also wanted to be recorded because they wanted to keep their voice for eternity. And uh, the record companies that evolved following the gramophone company um, all started to also reproduce cantorial music on their shellac records. And that had a certain effect I will talk about in a few minutes. First of all, I want to tell you a little about the story of the record companies, um, because the money was not made with the gramophones, but with the records. So many new companies came into being that specialized in recording the most popular thing of the time, and that was music. Um, and most of these record companies, like the Columbia, the RCA, or the EMI Electronics, were headed by Jewish entrepreneurs who had a sense of culture and a sense of economy, and brought these two things very successfully together. The record that you see here is a record of the biggest Polish record company, the Sirena record company founded by Julius Feigenbaum in 1904. And uh, there he also hired a very successful music director, uh, Henrik Warszawski, who became later famous as a composer of film music under the name Henrik Wars. He also, he was a composer, for instance, of the um, music of Ductory and the music of Flipper. So um, if you listen to, if you still remember the music of Flipper, that was the music director of Sirena Record in Warsaw. Um, one of the most successful and also um, most, um, you know, the imprint of the company in the involvement of uh, global music business was the Odeon Company. Odeon was also founded same year as Sirena in Warsaw in Berlin in 1904 by Max Strauss and Heinrich Zunz and a certain Karl Lindström. And uh, Odeon not only um, has the fame for inventing the double-sided record, a very simple idea to put a groove on both sides, um, but that doubled um, the length of uh, the recording and the, and the playing. Um, but they also were the first who really entered the global market. They started studios 
in the very first two years of their being between 1904 and 1906, in no other places like North Africa, Greece, Turkey, Egypt, Argentine, India, China, China, Singapore, East India, in Baghdad, East Africa, and Uganda. And what they did there was not selling Western European music, but they recorded the music of the people there. Um, as early as in 1905 and 1906, in 1906, they already had 11,000 titles of what you would call today ethnic music. And uh, the people who went all over the globe to do these things, uh, Max Glucksmann and the brothers Blumenthal, you guess, they all were Jewish. Um, and they also invented very nice uh, gramophones that you could carry along, so they made the music portable. But they also produced um, synagogue music, like this wonderful record uh, of the um, enlarged synagogue choir with Rabbi Frankel in Berlin. And all the other record companies started to follow their trace. So they also started to record music all over the world. And I just show you three examples of Jewish musicians they recorded all over the world. Uh, this was Rosa Eshkenazi on the Master's Voice record. Uh, Rosa Eshkenazi was a Turkish Greece uh, singer who was famous because she really popularized Rambetico in Greece. In, 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 in Greece. Oh, here we have a very early recording of Laila Murat, who was uh, the most famous singer in Egypt in the 1930s and 40s or Zora El Fasia, who was the favorite singer of, king, of the King of Morocco in the 1940s, before she emigrated in the 50s to Israel. I already said that the cantors became stars. And one thing that happened at that time was they became also popular among non-Jewish audiences. Um, the Brunswick Company, that was also one of the big um, American record companies in 1921 introduced uh, its public to um, a special foreign records catalog. Uh, it was introduced at the Pennsylvania Hotel in New York. It was a big party where they introduced their foreign records catalog for the first time. And the first record they presented to the public was a public was a record with Jewish cantor Savel Quartin, one of the cantorial stars of that time. Um, naturally, presenting a Col Nidre, the most the big seller on on, on records at that time. And the interesting thing that happened when these record companies started to record cantors was, first of all, the, the sacred music from the synagogue was taken in a completely secular environment, which is the living room, the parlor. Um, it was turned from something that had a function in a religious service, in a ritual, into something that had a function in a private ritual that was completely secular, family life. And it was introduced into bourgeois culture. So the, for the cantors, it was naturally something nice to sell their, rec sell their music in thousands and thousands in form of records, but it really changed their audience, because most people who listened to cantorial music became people who were not interested in the rituals anymore. And right. and as I said, Col Nidre was uh, naturally the biggest seller, but there were all kinds of uh, cantorial music, all songs from the synagogue and even complete rituals uh, or complete services were recorded. 
And uh, there was a big competition between cantors to become popular. This is just for the London people, one of the wonderful um, Jewish record shops in London selling uh, cantorial music. And the most famous of these cantors of the time was Josseler Rosenblatt. Josseler Rosenblatt was born in the Ukraine and uh, we all think about the Ukraine in these days. Um, and sometimes we, uh, at least in the public, it's mostly forgotten that this was the major center of Jewish culture of the world in these years between 1880 and 1920. And uh, Josseler Rosenblatt, he was born in the Ukraine in Bilatsverka. His father was a cantor in Kiev. And naturally, cantorial music was a family business. It was handed over through generations. Um, sons of cantors very, very often also became cantors in generation after generation. And um, he made a big career, uh, starting in Hungary, uh, in a little place named Mukachev, then in Bratislava. And then he came to Hamburg where his orthodox style of improvising cantorial music was not that much well uh, received. And he got a better offer that was New York. So he, in 1912, he crossed the Atlantic and in just a few years, he was the biggest cantorial star of the world. And uh, when in 1917, um, he was singing for a fundraising concert for Europe, at the Hippodrome Theater in New York, uh, there were 6,000 people in the audience um, applauding him. And uh, the Chicago Opera offered him the role of Eliazar in Halefi's La Juif. Um, he was uh, one of the first who were lingered, who got, attract, who got attracted by the bigger stage, but he refused. He said, I heard a voice in my ear, Yosula, don't do it. In 1933, he was offered to be filmed. And that was an offer he could not refuse because he was offered to be filmed in Palestine. It was actually his last tour. He died while shooting this film in Jerusalem. And uh, just to give you an impression of his voice and his appearance, um, you maybe understand why it was a good idea that he didn't went to the opera, but he was probably one of the most talented singers of his time. So, I mean, we could listen to that for hours, but you, I don't take you there. Um, another cantor who made it into the big show, and he did that because he quit the synagogue and started a world career as a singer, was Josef Schmidt. And Josef Schmidt, who was born in Chernovitz in 1904, um, was also not able to make a career on the opera stage because he was simply too little for a tenor hero uh, with his one meter 60 or something. Um, so his career was in the radio and on records. And he was the most popular star of uh, most popular singer of all singers. Uh, in Germany in the early 30s. And um, when in May 1933, the film and his song, A Song Goes Around the World, truly a, an emblematic title for the subject, uh, A Song Goes Around the World, uh, the film premiere was still allowed. 3,000 guests came to the film premiere while he 
a few months later went into exile and sadly died poor in Switzerland in 1942. But he was one of the first artists whose name was mentioned on a record sleeve. Um, at that time, there were no record covers. It was just these paper sleeves um, that were basically presenting mostly the program of a record company and not a certain singer, a certain music. But Josef Schmidt was the only one at that time, together with Caruso, whose name appeared on these sleeves. Another guy who also made it from the synagogue out into the big world was Richard Tucker, who was actually um, also a cantor, but he made it to the Metropolitan Opera and to television. So his cantorial services only appeared on television in the 1960s while he was singing on the Metropolitan Opera, but he started also in a little Brooklyn synagogue. Right. And the most famous of all these sons of cantors was L. Jolson, whose uh, appearance in the first talking movie, The Jazz Singer, um, exactly thematized his career as a son of a cantor, also um, from Eastern Europe. He was born in Lithuania, running away from home because he didn't want to become a cantor. And uh, yeah, the film portrayed fictitiously his story of running out of the synagogue into the global music business, becoming the most famous American singer of the 1930s. And here's just a little scene from the film, The Jazz Singer. His father, the cantor, is dying. And for one time, his son is returning to the synagogue, singing the Kol Nidre to console his dying father. Hier sieht man, hier sieht man ihn in einer Filmstudio-Synagoge, das Kol Nivre singen. So after this, his father can die in peace. But then, um, Al Jolson... Here, Jackie Rubinovitz, Jack Rubin, is returning to the bigger stage on Broadway and is doing what he really did in his career, performing in blackface, performing as a Negro singer. Um, that was one of the chances for, for Jewish entertainers um, to make a career in the beginning of the, 18th, of, of the 20th century, actually. And it was something um, that is really discussed again in the United States today because performing in blackface for Jews meant to prove that they were white because to go on the stage in blackface means you are white and you paint your face black. So it was a, a way to introduce the mainstream American culture. But the song he's singing here is a song for his Jewish mother in the first row. So in the end, he makes peace with his uh, Jewish father, who didn't want allow, to allow him to go on Broadway. And he's making peace with his always loving mother. And she allows him to marry the non-Jewish girl to become part of the mainstream culture. And yeah, the door to the mainstream culture is painting yourself black as a black singer. But he was not the only son of cantors who made who made it on the big stage of Broadway and then also 
in Hollywood. And he was also not the only one whose music was printed in million copies um, as sheet music. And that was actually with what people made the money at that time. It was printing music to be sang, uh, sung at home um, in the family. And uh, uh, the music um, editors, um, and the music publishers in the 28th Street of Manhattan um, produced songs, big, big hits every week. Um, and the, uh, the street, the 28th Street in Manhattan with all the mostly Jewish publishers of popular, popular music was soon to be called the, pin, uh, the tin, um, tin, Pally, tin Pan Alley. Tin Pan Alley because um, a famous music critic of the time, Monroe Rosenfeld wrote that the uh, pianos in all these publishing houses where they tried the music and uh, uh, where they, 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 they composed this music were so badly tuned that they, that they sound like uh, tin pans. Um, and Irving Berlin was a son of, son of a cantor, the guy who wrote White Christmas. Harold Allen was a son of a cantor who wrote um, the, the famous song um, from The Wizard of Oz. Uh, Kurt Weill was a son of a cantor. Um, and most of those composers, writers who produced the musical culture of uh, the US, uh, starting from Josh Gershwin, Sigmund Romberg, Jerome Kern, Hammerstein, Leonard Bernstein, Stephen Sondheim, Rogers and Hart, were all people who grew up in a Jewish culture of music that became too tight, too narrow for them. And uh, Rogers and Hart actually um, are those who produced the music that was published in the first album that got a record cover. I mean, everything had to be invented in that business and even the record cover had to be invented. The idea to create a specially designed cover for not a single record, but in this case, a, a, an album with five still Shellac records um, created by Alex Steinweiss for Columbia Records. And actually Columbia was also the company that 10 years later introduced the first LP to the market um, in 48, um, which was the first vinyl record that allowed um, a longer uh, time to be played, which made it possible for, uh, for instance, to record classic music without interrupting uh, the performance after five minutes all the time because the Shellac records couldn't could not be played as long. Yeah, and uh, from Austria, one greeting, everything you need to know about Austria, at least from the perspective of the US, is the sound of music. Also um, a Broadway musical um, staring um, Theodore Bickel in the main role of uh, Baron von Trapp, the good Austrian who's fighting against the Nazis. Um, but the music definitely was also by Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the plot. So it was also an all Jewish production. And uh, naturally one of the, 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 the first female stars um, come on the stage. Um, and one of them was Sophie Tucker. Um, she was also born in the Ukraine, um, on the actually on the road in a way, um, coming to the U.S. with her with her parents, and she also ran away from home to become a star on the stage, starting also in blackface, but then adopting another role, the role of the strong and uh, very self-confident woman, the red hot mama with her poignant songs, but she was also famous for singing My Yiddish Mama. But here I have a performance in London with one of her spicy, as it was put, her spicy songs. For the first time, for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce a real hot tucker song. I'll get your ears full. Where, oh, where is that 
Mr. Wright. Will he ever come along? I've been searching day and night, and all I find is Mr. Wrong. If that one and only one should come my way, I'll be sure to love him, come what may. <laughs> Hit it, Sophie. Yeah, she was uh, one of the first female stars on the stage. And Barbara Streisand, naturally, is maybe the biggest Jewish female star of all times. Um, and I just want to show you a little glimpse from this recording of a show in New York in 1965. Um, that was, um, she was performing in that show. Um, just at the time when the musical Fanny Bryce, uh, about Fanny Bryce, um, a funny girl was on, uh, performed on stage and she was Fanny Bryce, one of the uh, famous uh, Jewish entertainers of the 40s and 50s. There's a musical on Broadway now. Oh, funny girl. It's based on the life of Fanny Bryce. It's very good. I like it. In fact, I go there every night. Julie Stein has written a great, great score along with Bob Now. Here are some of the songs. I am woman. You are man. I am smaller, so you can be taller than. Ich lasse es mal bei dieser Pointe. Also, uh, man sieht, dass uh, die uh, popular, the, you see that the popular music performed uh, by singers like uh, Barbara Streisand or all of them also had a good portion of humor. And we'll come to that soon. But first, just to step back a little into the invention of Jewish folklore. Um, a lot of the stuff we, we now recognize as Jewish music, if we don't talk about cantorial synagogue music, um, mostly we talk about what is called Jewish folklore. But um, as this record cover indicates, in fact, Jewish folklore is an invention of the late 19th century. And it was mainly produced and created on Yiddish stages in Eastern Europe after the 1870s. Abraham Goldfaden was the first who was uh, performing together with Jewish singers in Romania and produced Yiddish theater plays, performed in Romania and in Odessa and in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And then everywhere in Eastern Europe, Yiddish theaters opened their stages, and the mass migration from Eastern Europe to first Central and Western Europe, and then to the United States and the South America and the South Americas and to Canada brought the Yiddish theater songs over to literally everywhere. And very soon these artistic theater songs were considered to be real. Um, Yiddish folklore, popular folklore, uh, songs like Donna Donna and My Städtele Bells, and, and, and you name it, you know these songs, they are all product produced for the theater and are not really folklore. And uh, one of the craziest stories um, of one of these uh, Jewish folk songs um, is the story of By Mir Bist du Schön. Um, it happened in the years between 1932 and 1937, and that was the time of the ultimate crossover in American popular history. Um, in 1932, Shalom Sekunda and Jacob Jacobs they wrote together a song for a Yiddish musical um, for the 1933 season of the Roland Theater, a Yiddish theater in New York that was able to host 1,630 people, not a little 
Theater. Um, the name of the musical was Men can leben, nor men lost nicht. You can live, you, you could live, but they don't let you. Um, and um, one of the songs of the, of the play was written in C minor and performed by a loving couple. It was very kitschy. Uh, they sold it for 30 bucks to a music editor. editor. And then it took about four years. And in 1937, the song was uh, performed in the Catskills. It was performed by Johnny and George, a black vaudeville couple, a duo, um, who regularly performed in the Jewish hotels in the Catskills. And they sang the song in Yiddish, um, but heavily syncopized, a little more jazzy. Um, and they also, they, they, they sang that song in the Apollo Theater in New York. And Sammy Khan, a producer and composer, and Lou Levy, Levi from Leeds, they attended the show and they had a great idea. The bought, they bought the song and changed some lines, the rhythm, and turned the whole thing back into, well, not back, they turned it into English. And then, uh, and with a half Yiddish, half German title still, by Mia bis du schön. And then um, they looked for somebody to perform it. And out of all, they decided to let it be performed by a largely unknown female duo whose parents were from Norway and Greece and not Jewish at all, the Andrews sisters. At that time, nobody knew the Andrews sisters. And they also never had sung anything Yiddish before. Um, but within two years, the Andrews sisters had sold a million records of By Mir Bis Tushen, and they were the first female vocal group ever to win a gold record award and were famous at that time. Not exactly as famous and more um, directing their performances to Jewish um, audiences were the Bagelman sisters. Um, at the left side, we still have a record where they are the Bagelman sisters um, and uh, Clara and Minnie. And on the right side, they are already the Berry sisters because they tried to sell their songs also to a Jewish assimilated and not exactly nostalgic Eastern Europe um, audience, but also to a wider audience. Here you see the two and here's one of their hits, Bublitschki Beigelach. So, now I come to London, because London has the fame of being the town where Jewish humor was invented. I don't know if you know that, but um, in 1912, um, this first uh, record of Joe Heyman um, was uh, recorded, Cohen on the phone. And uh, it was a record that was the first, actually, the first humoristic record that was sold over one million times. Um, it's just a stand-up comedian number where um, um, a half Yiddish, half English speaking immigrant to London is negotiating with his landlord and he doesn't understand his landlord and his landlord does not understand him. Um, it's obviously, uh, making jokes about a Jewish migrant who has difficulties to adopt and to maneuver with the language and being 
polite enough with somebody ranking higher than him. And but on the other hand, it's it's about a Jewish migrant who's definitely has his pride and his dignity. And uh, a landlord is not something very particular for him. So um, it's two people who think that they are ranking higher than the other, and they can't understand each other. And it was the beginning of a series of uh, Cohen on the on the plane, and Cohen at the university, and Cohen um, at this and at the opera, and Cohen that records. And that was actually the first. Jewish humor that made it popular, that became popular among non-Jews. And the recipe was the pride of a migrant who is not adopting to the majority, but he is not feeling bad about it. And uh, so there is a certain tension in this kind of humor. And uh, this is a recipe that is uh, followed by many, many, many others. And uh, it's starting to universalize in the 1950s and in the 1960s, when one of the most famous uh, Jewish humor records was, you don't have to be Jewish to be humorous. Uh, so it became a recipe of self-mocking humor that has also an expression of pride. And... Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, it was the biggest time of universalist humor performed by Jews in all kinds of senses. There was those who still performed in Yiddish, like Jima, Jigan and Schumacher. There was people who explained to the American popular, the American uh, great audiences how to be a Jewish mother. And this manual also explains that you don't need to be Jewish to be a Jewish mother. Um, and it explained what it is. Uh, there was the sick humor of Lenny Bruce, who was uh, making fun of everything, even of picnicking on the cemetery. And there was a lot of uh, Jewish humor. There was uh, about sex. It was about uh, Jewish mothers. It was about psychology, about shrinks. You have here Dr. Murray Banks, tells Jewish stories, mit psychology, mit psychology. Um, and that was a big time in the 1960s and actually in the 1970s, it was over. And there were, are many theories about why the big event of uh, Jewish humor came to an end um, in the 1960s and in the 1970s. Um, and uh, I will come to that in a minute. The last uh, and the most Michigan uh, Jewish humorist I wanted to introduce to you is uh, Mickey Katz, who was became famous performing with uh, parodies of uh, of American popular songs, uh, turning them into Yiddish songs. So he just made it the other way round, like this: the Yiddish mambo. On the sidewalks of old New York, my Bobby is blowing her car. She digs his lip for a little lick. She's on an F for Cuban kick. Yeah, one of the reasons why. The big advent of Jewish humor in the 1970s came to advent was that Israel became a subject of, of quarrel and not only of adoration. And in 1967 and even more in 1973, um, Israel became vulnerable and uh, debatable. And uh, that was one reason. The other reason was that the, the Shoah as a subject came back. The traumatic experience that was not talked about for many years became a very prominent subject again in the late 60s and in the 70s and 80s. Um, and the big advent of Jewish universalism in the 
late 50s and early 60s, which was the engagement in the civil rights movement in the United States also became fragile because tensions between the black movement and the Jewish universalist civil rights activists also became very much um, on the very much uh, on the surface. Um, so this big event of universalist humor about the fate of immigrants um, in a way came to an end. And Israel became the big subject of identity in a very naive way with the common Israeli dancers and singers in a more militant way in all the records that produced the heroes of the Six Day War and the Israeli Air Force and everything you can uh, talk about. Even in Germany, records with songs from Israel were produced uh, here with a very interesting cover showing Golda Meir alone in a kind of a barbed wire um, star of David surrounded by dangerous Arabs. Uh, that is a more improvised record of German uh, Christian Jew lovers and Israel lovers uh, from the early 70s. Right. Yeah, and this is an example for another love for Israel that is much, very much more prominent today, but it was already after 67. This is a record produced by Jean-Marie Le Pen, who at the time, I mean, the big uh, fascist from uh, France, um, who at that time was as a historian editing records. It was his business at the time mostly with military music and folklore music and history. And he, he produced a big album uh, showing his adoration for the state of Israel with a lot of military music, folklore music, radio news from the whole history of the state um, and comments by him. And yeah, this is uh, another example of the Carmon singers with all, already in the 1950s, still, still in the 1950s, with some humor. Jaffa Handel, who is one of the girls on the cover here, said about her costumes, they are partly biblical, partly Arab, and partly polyester. And then came in the 1960s the reinvention, the re-reinvention of Jewish folk music. Uh, Theodor Bickel was one of the first who in the 1960s, uh, even early and late 1950s, started to produce uh, Jewish folk songs as a part of the folk music um, movement. Uh, he also produced Israeli folk songs. Um, he had to admit that this, this wonderful girl was not a kibbutznik, uh, but a, a model from New York that they took to Long Island to make this photograph. Um, and they could not uh, offer her address to uh, the lovers of the record because they thought that this is Israel. And one of the most uh, famous record companies who were um, really producing the, the wave of folk music in the US, and that was not only Jewish folk music, that was then popular folk music from all the world, was Folkway Records. Actually, it was the son of Shalom Ash who founded that record company, Mo Ash, um, Ash International, still in the 40s, but then he uh, started recording um, Woody Guthrie and other folk singers like Pete Seegers and uh, did folk songs from all the world. And here's just a little seed for Pete Seegers performing Zena Zena with a changed text because the text of Tzena Tzena originally is praising um, Jewish soldiers coming into a moshaf, but uh, the communist Peter Seegers and his band, the Weavers, turned the song into a communist song. Tzena, 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 
and the sun that sun that sun that sun where all our friends will find us with the dancers there. Gather, gather, join the celebration. There'll be people there from every nation. The dawn will find us laughing in the sun. So as a it's it's the line where it's about the Jewish soldiers coming to the Moshaf that they turned into coming uh, people from every nation coming into the city square. Uh, but still Jews were proud that they could listen in America to this wonderful Zionist song, not, not really realizing that it was turned into a communist song. Just a few examples of one thing that was completely forgotten and that was the Arab Jewish music. That was the dark side of the foundation of Israel, that uh, Israel had to confront itself as Europe against the Orient. And particularly in the first 30 years of the state, um, the Jews who came from Arab countries, from North Africa or from Iraq or um, even from Persia, um, were assimilated in a very fast pace and uh, very few maintained their Arab Jewish culture. And uh, already showed you one record by Zora El Fasia, the favorite singer of uh, the King of Morocco. When she came to uh, Israel, the record company of Israel, Head Artsy, was not interested in anything musicians like her did singing in Arab, singing Arab melodies, uh, singing Jewish songs with an Arab tune, with an Arab text, that was not something Israel wanted to swallow. So she was lucky at least because two Jewish brothers from Morocco, the Azulai brothers, who started a little record shop at the uh, clock tower in Jaffa that still exists, um, they wanted to sell their music. And when they realized that their music did not exist in Israel, they founded a record company, Tzakifon, and started to publish all their beloved Moroccan, Libyan, Egyptian, Algerian musicians. Here's this as a sampler with all their stars. And she is still around. I mean, uh, Zora El Fasia died poor in Ashkelon in a little apartment uh, known by only a very few people. Uh, Raymond is uh, next generation. She's called the blonde bombshell from Casablanca. I mean, now she's also um, aged and she's still doing a Moroccan, um, critical Moroccan theater in Israel and uh, very much politically engaged in the Mizrahi movement. And I just give you a little, little glimpse to Laila Murat, the big Egyptian star who stayed in Egypt. She was attacked as a Zionist uh, in the 1950s, but then survived these attacks and lived peacefully to it until her, she died. But her big career was ended when Nasser started his anti-Zionist careers. But in the 1940s, she was still the most important music star in Egypt in films like that. Okay, this was Egyptian cinema in 1949. Things changed a little after that. So this is all what I can't tell you now because time is over. <laughs> I just come to a little, little story in the end that is not the typical stuff you would expect from Jewish music and that is the Ramones, the death of pop, Jews and punk. And... One of the surprising uh, insights we got when we were working 
on that exhibition in uh, 2013, 2014, was the simple fact that most of the punk bands had at least half of Jewish members. There were punk bands that were all Jewish, like the Beastie Boys or um, uh, Bad Religion um, or Alan Vega. Uh, but most of them were split into half Jewish, half not Jewish, sometimes half Jewish, half German. And um, if you listen to their music, you have sometimes the idea that the punk music was the expression of a fight about Nazism on the stage between Jews and sometimes even Nazis, because one of the Ramones was a big admirer of Hitler and of George W. Bush, I have to say. And um, they articulated their quarrels musically on the stage. For instance, in this one of his, their biggest and, and first biggest hits, and that was uh, Blitzkrieg, Bob. No. One of their other songs was Commando, and uh, the refrain of their song Commando was, first rule is the laws of Germany, that means the Nuremberg laws, second rule is be nice to mommy, third rule, this is the Jewish law, third rule is don't talk to commies, that is the right-wing mainstream law, and fourth rule is eat kosher salamis. So that was the kind of humor of punk bands in the 1970s. And actually the, the, the hotbed of most of the punk bands in New York was the legendary New York rock club CBGB, um, country bluegrass, blues, and other music for uplifting gourmandizers. And that was found by Hillel Crystal, also the son of a Russian Jewish immigrant. And that was the hotbed of most of the new wave bands in the, 96, in the 1970s and also um, the punk bands. And uh, they were pretty explicit. Alan Vega, the singer of the band Suicide, called this club our synagogue. And one of the things he always told was to the public, we are giving them Treblinka. So they really wanted to do everything to provoke their Jewish parents and their non-Jewish parents. And uh, articulating things like that from Blitzkrieg to Treblinka was probably the best recipe to provoke everybody. And uh, The Clash did the same. And uh, Bad Religion is an actual punk band still performing. Uh, this was the Christmas album they just released in 2000. 13 in time for our exhibition. And uh, what they did not succeed was definitely the first thing they wanted, and that was destroying pop. They didn't manage to do that because there's so much uh, postmodern stuff around that is with irony or without irony, uh, producing the travesty of everything that was done in music history. Um, and the punkers were not able to stop that ever new creating music business that is uh, simply swallowing every expression of music in the world into something new. But still, um, the punk music was in a way the last, the last new invention in the history of pop music, even if it was an attempt to end it, because everything that came afterwards is a kind of remixing of traditions and uh, reformulating of things that had already be there. Yeah, and now I just want to give you two little examples of this postmodern trend. Uh, one is um, a very nice version of the song 
Egyptian girl, Mizirlu, which is already something very, very hybrid. Um, an old song from the beginning of the 20th century invented somewhere between Rembetiko, Turkish music and Sephardic music. It was sung in Turkey, in Armenia. It was sung in Greek, Ladino, Yiddish, Arabic. Became popular in the West for a short time in 1962 and was, re and was rediscovered by a very interesting Israeli, Russian disco, pop, whatever, postmodern band, Jew Rhythmics. And uh, he is just serving the chosen is their slogan. And this is what they serve. Featuring Joe Fleisch. just show you the end of it. So, and though they got lost in space. And the last thing I just want to show you is the first lines of a song you all know, If I Was a Rich Man, performed by the um, Bosnian artist. Um, oh, this is Grand Stephanie. I will leave that out. Damir Niksic. That was done in the 90s during the Bosnian War. If I wasn't Muslim, if I wasn't born Mohammedan, life for me would have been fun. I could live and prosper on my land and I could even build a bigger house. I wouldn't have to every now and then run and hide like a mouse. If I wasn't Muslim, my neighbors wouldn't set my home on fire and surround me with barbed wire. I wouldn't live in terror. Books wouldn't teach you that I was an error in European history. So that's it. If I wasn't Muslim, I stop that. I warned you I could do that for hours, but I made it. Okay, thank you very much for this extremely super fascinating lecture, Hanno. I think now is time for questions. Let me explain how we do this. If you would like to ask the speaker a question, please write your name. And I mean, just your name, not the question, just the name in your chat box and press return so that we can find you on screen and unmute you. You can see the chat function in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. So over to you. Kinga, our first question goes to you. Yes, yeah. Um, thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Hanno, for your really fascinating talk. Um, I've, I've got a question um, that relates to this really mind-blowing Jew Rhythmics um, video clip that you showed 
um, in, in the end. And I was wondering, what is the reach of, of that kind of music? I mean, where is it popular? Who, who listens to it? I find it incredibly wonderful and, and fascinating, but who, who engages with, with that kind of um, music? Where is it listened to? I don't think that they became very popular. Uh, they did not do many records. There's a few other songs. They performed mainly in clubs in Tel Aviv. And I think for, for a while also in Moscow and in Berlin. But uh, they did not make a big career. I mean, that was really for a very special audience. Thank you. Well, they definitely have a fan more because I'm going to track them down. Once, once we're done with this talk, it's really, really fantastic. I, I love the aesthetics. It's just absolutely great. So thank you for, for introducing me to that. I might have a question, uh, Mahano. Can you elaborate a bit more about what really happened in the 60s? You know, when suddenly, for po seemingly for political reasons, um, the attraction of this kind of music stopped to be attractive. I mean, I that's, mean that, that's your take on it, um, that this kind of end of a story has to do with the changing political world. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's definitely something happening to to this wave of Jewish humor that came about in the 50s and 60s. And that is definitely coming to an end. Um, there is a big thing happening that I didn't talk about, um, which is the, the advent of, of Klesmer mm -hmm. in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do, I mean, the interesting thing was in the 50s and 60s, this um, new wave of Jewish folklore by people like uh, Theodore Bickel and others um, was part of a, a very much universalist approach to folklore music as music from the working people, the simple people, um, it was not about nationalism. It was a it was a social utopia, in this uh, new recognition of folklore music. So it's not it's not uh, it's not a surprise that uh, people like Pete Seeger were so much involved in the nineteen fifties, um, mm -hmm. and uh, people like him. So in the nineteen sixties. Um, this is coming in a way to an end because this folklore movement splits into those who go into electronic music mm -hmm. like uh, Bob Dylan mm -hmm. and those who still do uh, what Dylan did uh, with uh, um, singers in the early 60s. Um, and then, I mean, the early 60s were a kind of incubation time for mm -hmm. what happened in 68. And the, the field of culture was, was the area where the, all this energy prepared itself for what came in, in the late 60s. And after that, and, and then in the late 60s, the people did not, prim, 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 I mean, then it was rock music mm -hmm. and it was not folk music anymore. And uh, and then in the 1970s, people started to go back to identity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Klesmer movement was part of that. And uh, the people who started with the Klesmer music in the, in the middle of the 70s were also leftists who were engaged in street music before, who were doing, who were doing jazz, they were doing all kind of more 
socially engaged universalist stuff. But then they started to rewrite music, Jewish music history by going back to the, the Jewish street music. Um, that was uh, not always about songs. It was more music that was performed at weddings and celebrations and on the street. And that was mostly instrumental music. Mm -hmm. And and that was the time when, when people started again to think about Jewish identity and about black identity and about this identity and that identity and all this universalism that was so prominent in the first half of the 60s. Also, even in this uh, Jewish leftist circles mm -hmm. uh, came to an end and people wanted to reconstruct uh, the music before the Shoah, and they wanted to reconstruct the experiences of the Shoah survivors. Um, so the whole stuff became much more earnest, much more, in a way, serious, uh, nothing to make fun about at that time. Um, and so the 70s was a pretty, a time not good for humor mm -hmm. for many reasons. The universalist spirit was, in a way, discredited. Um, Israel was not the safe harbor anymore, but a vulnerable place in the world that some identified even more because of that and some distanced themselves from it because of the same reasons. Uh, but it, it was not as triumphant for at least leftists anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean... Slowly, slowly, things happen that we now see that Israel, that was until the until 1967, and even a little later, was something praised by leftists, became something praised by rightists. And this record by Jean-Marie Le Pen is definitely one of the icons of this turning point, mm -hmm. um, when simply the scene of people who admired Israel uh, changed very much. Mm -hmm. Also not very good for humor. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, Jackie Mason was then the most prominent Jewish humorist and he was a racist. I mean, somebody who's himself a right-winger. Mm -hmm. So the, the, mm -hmm. in the, 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 the humor, if it still existed, changed into... Mm -hmm something very different. Mm -hmm. Tens has a question. Yes, yes, Frau Tenza, it's your turn and then Michael. You have to unmute yourself. So thank you. It's wonderful to see Hanno and I'm so happy you're doing this. And Marlena. Hi, I hope all is well. Um, I, because I'm a cantor, and it's my 36th year in my congregation. I have gone through a time when women just didn't do something like this and other congregations did not appreciate it. But the direction of the cantorate has changed. Um, there are so many more women in reform and even in conservative congregations. And I don't think that many in, in Orthodox, but a singer like Debbie Friedman, um, started to write healing music. And we know of Orthodox congregations and Chabadniks who use her melody and don't mm -hmm. even realize it's her melody for the mm -hmm. Chabdallah service or whatever. So it's interesting how this is happening. Um, I studied with a very fine cantor who taught at the seminary and told me that the direction of the cantorate is going to change. And there are many who are against this, but there's nothing they can do about it. And it will change. There are many more women now. Um, and, uh, and they're showing that they can do just as, as well uh, in so many ways and add their ability to nurture and whatever. Um, and I love seeing this because when I first started, there were not that many women doing it at all. I actually wanted to show two examples of cantorial music by women, early examples. And uh, when I had to cut down and cut down and cut down my uh, talk, 
somehow I lost these two records. The Malavsky family, which is a family yeah. choir, but with women, early yes. in the 50s, doing cantorial music. And Scheindler, who was uh, a singer who did, uh, and she did uh, also cantorial music very yeah. early in the six, early 60s. However, she had a very low voice. Her voice almost sounded like a male voice. So when you have somebody who has a much higher yeah. voice, it's a whole other ball game. And I see what's happening is <laughs> the um, um, people are changing in a sense that they want to be equal. Uh, the congregations want egalitarian services. And uh, I don't know how long the Chabadniks will be able to keep things, the tradition that they say, because things are changing. Uh, one, one little point I want to make. Um, I mean, one interesting phenomenon is that, I mean, when we worked on this global music story, we confined ourselves in a very harsh way to records. So um, we lost about 20 years that was mainly present on CD. <laughs> yeah. And the interesting thing is, But also, one thing is interesting. Um, I think the big, the time where cantorial music was popular on records um, or on CDs came to an end in a way. It's not that much. I mean, now it's back to the synagogue. Yes. And also the, 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 the singers, the, the female cantors, are really part of a reform movement in the synagogue and not, not something so much about making music for, for listening, listen to it at home. That's right. um, so this is also, this is, is, is somehow another phenomenon. It's, it's outside of what I would call the global music business. And also what's happening is that people um, they don't want to just sit and listen to a cantorial singer. They want to participate. They want to sing as well. And this is how things are changing. So the, the female cantors are encouraging them, female cantors and male cantors are encouraging them to participate, for everyone to sing when you're doing something about healing, for everyone to do this, put their arms around each this other. Is, this is community life. This is the life of the congregation. Absolutely. But it It's wasn't different. that way all the years. It yeah. wasn't that. People were sitting and listening mm. to the great cantors and not participating. And people got tired of doing this. And it yeah. really has changed. Uh, Hanu, I just wanted to thank you for always including me whenever we have our, um, uh, when we get together with the Hohenems, with the um, reunion. The reunion. <laughs> you have always included me and that meant so much and I remember how people would say we can't believe that you know that she's also that she's able to do this to be on the stage to be able to sing whether it's Havana Gila or whatever it is because years ago they would have booed me right off the stage and we had you saw we had so much fun doing this and getting people involved in everything and that's because of you yes We have some more questions. Um, Michael and Marcel, maybe first, Michael. Yeah, also thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, I just, because you mentioned the composer of Daktari and Flipper and so on, I just <laughs> wanted to ask you about, um, about the kind of the role of television or if there's a role for television in your story. Did some of the singers you're talking about and some of the composers, um, make a career in television or what was did television cut short careers of some of your protagonists so um. yeah, I mentioned briefly I mentioned one and that is I um, mean Richard Tucker the cantor who um, in 19 about 1945 um, wanted to I mean got an offer to be engaged at the Metropolitan Opera and had a long discussion with his congregation. And his congregation wrote letters to uh, the conservative uh, Jewish theological seminary asking them, can we allow our cantor to sing at the stage of the Metropolitan Opera? And uh, the very wise Solomonic answer of the Jewish theological seminar was, uh, 
you better allow him because if you don't allow him, he's gone. <laughs> I mean, he was he he was gone anyhow. A few years later, um, he was only on the Metropolitan Opera, not anymore in his congregation. But he stayed present on television as the most as the American television cantor. So there was regularly uh, shows with him uh, where he celebrated his Shabbat or whatever for on television, um, showing that Jews are part of America and we have a culture and we have to show it. Um, so he was really the television cantor. And I mean, just another example I all, that was also, I, I had a photo in it in the, in the presentation, but I, I slipped over her because her story is too long to tell. Um, Esther Offerim and Abi Offerim, I mean, they were really made for television. And they were the, the nice representatives of Israel in Europe. And they were singing music of the world. The interesting thing was, I mean, they came from Israel. They were both from Sephardic back background. Um, so they were not loaded. They, were, they, they, they didn't have so much Holocaust in their package. Mm -hmm. um, they were singing. I mean, they were singing beautifully. Uh, they were singing with humor. I mean, in particular, uh, uh, Abi Offerim was really a joker, I mean, making jokes all the time. But they were singing songs from all over the world. That was part of this universalist songs from the world movement. And among the songs of the world, regularly they performed Israeli songs. And then there came an Irish song and an Italian song and a German song. Uh, they recorded German Kinderlieder. They recorded all kind of folklore, folk, folklore music. And Israeli music was kind of normalized. It was folklore among folklore. That was in the 60s. And after 67, they moved into more of the pop music business. Uh, they lived in London. They did this wonderful Cinderella Rockefeller song with a wonderful movie. Uh, you can look it up in the internet, uh, the, the two of them performing on Piccadilly Square, Cinderella Rockefeller. Also one of the clips I couldn't show you, but you find it in the internet on YouTube. Um, and they were really the television stars of the 60s. Most prominent in Germany, um, in London, then they split, and, and uh, Esther Offerim continued her career as a solo singer, went back to Israel for a time. Uh, a few years ago, she still performed. She's living in Hamburg. She now has another name, um, and she married a, a German noble and is living in Hamburg, and she's still singing. But she was very much present on TV as a part of the disco pop folklore and then pop music business on TV. Marcel, and yeah. you had all the had people in German television mm -hmm. like uh, um, yeah, the one who Ilya, Ilya Richter, mm -hmm. also a Jewish guy who was the moderator, the, the, the host of the German pop song show on television. Marcel, you had a question? Yes, um, thank you very much. This was an extremely interesting talk. Uh, the, the, my question was when, when you showed this, uh, the, the blackface uh, stuff. So this is, this is obviously, I think it's quite clear what we think about this nowadays. My, uh, I was wondering whether you happen to know anything. How was this scene at the time? Like on the one hand, the performers, what did they think they were doing? So did they reflect in any way what it was they were they were doing and also the audiences and maybe also like i imagine uh, black artists at the time they must have had their thoughts on this kind of thing was this completely different from how we think about this nowadays or similar or i think it's different i mean it has it has stages i mean in the in the in the development of this kind of music I mean, first of all, um, black music in the 19th century was either performed 
in the farms in the south to entertain yourself or to entertain your master. So that was a racist, either a racist thing or a self-expression thing. But it did not, but, but black music did not make it into the north. Then Irish musicians started to perform in blackface in minstrel shows for white people. That was black, black people were not allowed to perform in front of white people if it's not their masters, slave masters. But uh, they were not allowed to perform on a stage for, white, for a white audience for, for, for a long time. So the white audience was interested in their music. So those who were also a bit on the margin of society and that were Catholic Irish people started to do that to entertain the a little higher strata of Protestant, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. So that was the first wave. Minstrel shows, mostly Irish performers in blackface performing for a mostly Protestant uh, audience. And then starting in the 1910s or something, it became a more Jewish thing to do that. And that was the time when Jews still were not really considered to be part of white people in the US. They were still considered also in the US as another race. So, um, and they also were not really making it on the, on the stage of mainstream culture. So in a way to perform in blackface for many Jewish artists was a chance to, to, get, to get on the stage. And the interesting thing was that then later on, blacks started to take over that thing by also performing in blackface and making fun of white people in blackface. And that was the moment where this whole blackface thing was over. When the, when the black were self-confident enough to make their jokes about white people who perform in blackface. So there's a, there's a wonderful movie about it, Bamboozle, that tells the story of blacks making fun of white people in blackface. So naturally today, this is a no-go apart from maybe a black um, comedian who is still making fun of it. But that was definitely not the case in the 1920s when blackface or 1910s, when people like Al Johnson started to perform mm -hmm. on the stage in shows, vaudeville shows. And there was a time when racism was still so normal. I mean, making jokes about Negroes, nobody could cared about that. I would like to And it was ambivalent because it was making jokes about them, but also a fascination of their music. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that is this kind of ambivalence you have relating to quite a number of minorities and, and others in different societies. I would like to come in here. Um, you know, following your, 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 your lecture, what I can see are kind of two main pathways. One is a pathway of the crossover, and the other one is a pathway of, maybe you can call it identity politics, and especially Klesmer. You mentioned this is an extremely interesting example here. On one hand, we do have, in the States, Klesmer, and crossover between the 1920s and 1950s, you know, Klesmer and jazz or Klesmer and Latino or Latino bands performing, yeah. I mean, Jewish clubs in, in the Catskills because they couldn't perform in white New York. Yeah. And um, so this is maybe a extremely nice example for crossover, but when it comes to the reinvention of Klesmer in the 70s, 80s, folk music, there seems that something else is happening. And we have kind of two reinventions. We have one 
which I think is highly problematic in Germany, performed by Gentiles. But we have the reinvention in the States, also now in the 90s, which is something quite different. Quite different, I mean. Could you elaborate a little bit about these two different reinventions and also link to the question of losing humor, dealing with the past, or maybe another opening up in the States in the 80s, in the 90s? I mean, I mean, one thing that I think in the 1970s motivated street musicians, Jewish street musicians, Jewish folklore musicians, jazz musicians to study musical traditions from Eastern, East, Eastern uh, Europe before the Shoah mm -hmm. had definitely to do with First of all, being fed up with Israeli folklore that is so prominent in Jewish everyday life in the Jewish in Jewish youth clubs and everywhere. So I mean, one of the reasons was they didn't want to have that um, partly what was it partly biblical, partly Arab, partly plastic um, kind of Israeli folklore anymore. They had a serious interest in the world before the Shoah, not mm -hmm. only because with respect to music, but with respect to everything. Mm -hmm. There was a big nostalgic idea of some kind of get, I mean, Yiddish, just to rediscover Yiddish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that was a big thing in, in New York and other places in, 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 in California and in uh, some parts of the Jewish public. Mm -hmm. And naturally, some of the leftist spirit was still there because they were investing their interest in the music of simple people, mm -hmm. poor people. And there was one thing that was already present in that rediscovery of these music traditions, and that, that was an interest in the revolutionary music of the Bund, the Bundist music. That was workers' music. I mean, that was music, songs of the Jewish workers movement that was in a way Jewish national, but socialist national, not, not with the perspective of a territory, but simply as a social movement that defined itself as culturally Jewish. And, and that also had a kind of renaissance in, in this plasma renaissance in the US. In Germany, it was completely different. I mean, this was a kind of nostalgia for the Jewish world before that was was very often driven by some kind of uh, a need to re re no, to to redeem and to na uh, versöhnen, um, reconcile, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and. Uh, even if some of these German musicians also are great klezmerists. I mean, some of them are really good mus musically. It's not only, only kitsch what they produce. And the better klezmer bands also in Germany are also doing crossover things with, with tango and with jazz. And, and then there is a, a little new thing in the last, let's say, eight years or so, and that is a new renaissance of uh, this revolutionary Jewish music, I mean, performed by people like Daniel Kahn, who himself also calls himself a Yiddish punker, and he was doing great music. I mean, he's coming from uh, Detroit, uh, but he's living in Berlin, and he's part of this Jewish renaissance movement that is somehow evolving on some margins in Berlin today. And there was a young musician in uh, in Vienna, a lady who's doing uh, Bundist songs, um, Isabel Frey, courageous young lady who is uh, really fighting against the Jewish mainstream in Vienna with a group called the uh, Jewish uh, Bolshevinerinnen, the Bolshevi Bolsheviennese, um, and is doing radical leftist old Yiddish music songs and rewriting them with new texts 
So this is a small new movement that is, exists. Um, so this is the third renaissance of, uh, she's not doing klezmer, she wouldn't, have, she wouldn't call it klezmer what she's doing. Thank you. So then I would like, if there are no other questions, no, then I would like to, your, to bring to an end the official part of this online event. And my thanks go out to Hanno for a superb lecture. And um, I would like to hear more about this for sure. So <laughs> I urge you to buy the book um, 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 about these exhibitions, brilliant. And also if you come across DVDs, most of this music you can buy on DVDs, buy them. Yeah, I have to say one thing, um, and that is um, our German catalog is sold out. It was a successful show, but we still have copies of our English catalog and uh, we even ship them. Um, and uh, the name of the catalog is Jukebox Jukebox. Um, and uh, there's one thing I want to say that this project, this exhibition and the whole research that uh, came into the book was only possible because we really, in the process of two years working on that subject, we really came across so passionate record lovers and scholars and mostly both um, who shared their collections with us and who shared their knowledge with us and their idea and their humor. One unfortunately died uh, not, mm -hmm. a, not a year ago um ray wolf who was the biggest record collector of um shellac records actually mostly um all kind Jew, all, all kind of jewish stuff and jazz what we needed was the jewish stuff and he was really helping us so much with the exhibition and uh his collection is now taking care in weimar um in a jewish or a music archive, so it's not lost. But um, then we also met people in Israel who were devoted, or in California, who were devoted to this Arab Jewish music, mm -hmm. something uh, that really is almost forgotten everywhere that it exists. And uh, yeah, so I mean, things have to be kept mm -hmm. somehow for memory. And uh, some of these things were really almost lost. So go and buy the book by Hanno. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thanks again. And um, I hope to see you again. Our next lecture series will take place on May the 5th, probably at the German School Institute, hopefully, we don't know yet. And it will be dedicated to the story of ambivalences, Jewish topics and characters in East German television. But we let you know whether we'll be at the German School Institute or whether we'll, it will be again on Zoom. We don't know yet, but we let you know. But we hope very much that you can really meet for real. Good night <laughs> and safe journey back home. And thanks again, Hanno. <laughs>